Mark, I'll try to call you after the meeting as you okay. wrote. Yeah. I tried on Friday, but always. Okay, so it is 10 a.m. Paris time, and um, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, very unusual um, 115th Les Ouches session. Uh, normally, uh, what you see the, uh, on my screen should be what everybody should be seeing. Um, so this will unfortunately be uh, virtual. Uh, this time, but um, we will, I mean, we thank you all for uh, uh, nevertheless being present uh, to this uh, Les Ouch, uh, session. Um, I would like first to um, acknowledge uh, a number of people who've been instrumental in making this, uh, um, this uh, school possible. And first and foremost, the program's director, Christophe Salomon, who trusted us to uh, put this, uh, this school together, and uh, the, um, the admin team, so main admin, Annie Glomo, and uh, assistant admin, Muriel Gardet, whom you've had contact with um, in order to register for this uh, meeting. Uh, the next people I would like to, uh, to thank are the uh, co-organizers who have been also very helpful in um, putting the program together and organizing the, the various elements. Um, so uh, in alphabetical order, um, we have uh, Raf Clayson from uh, Würzburg, uh, we have uh, Masashi Kawasaki from Tokyo. We have Jochen Mannhardt from Stuttgart, and I think he'll recognize what this picture is from. Uh, we have uh, Andy Millis, who uh, will be with us this afternoon, um, and from Columbia and Flatiron Institute. We have uh, Jean-Marc Triscone from uh, Geneva University. Um, myself, you saw my picture, so no need to introduce myself. Uh, what I would like to say is that there is this website. Uh, I gave the link here, and you should always consult it because if you go to the various tabs, in particular the programs tab, uh, you'll see information pertaining to the, uh, the schedule and also uh, relevant information uh, about the operating mode, which in various email I, um, I just laid out, but in case you forgot, just, just check these. Um, at the bottom of uh, this uh, picture we have, of uh, this slide, we have the uh, virtual ascent of the Mont Blanc, so if you attempt it, you can, you can do that. I would also would like to um, thank the uh, sponsors they've been uh, very generous and um and and so you see their logo um here at the top of the screen in particular you have um you have the um deutsch um, Französische hochschule and they've been uh, they've, they've been very nice to us and uh, they allowed us to put ralph and jochen on board for uh, for this, uh, for this event. Uh, there is CNRS, which is the uh, Research Institute, um, which also was uh, instrumental in allowing financially this, uh, this event to take place. So without further ado, let me just uh, show the schedule. And for this morning, you see that um, 
Our first speaker will be uh, Manuel uh, Bibes. And, um, and so I will first give a very brief introduction of, uh, of Manuel. And then, um, then he will be um, giving the first, he will kickstart the school with the first lecture. Okay, so uh, Manuel uh, Bibes is a CNRS research director at the CNRS Thales Research Center in Palaiso, France. He got a dual PhD degree in France and Spain in 2001, where he studied uh, manganite interfaces. After two years of postdoc uh, on ox oxide spintronics with Albert Fert in Orsay, he was appointed to CNRS. Uh, Manuel pioneered research activity on multiferroics and oxide-based spin filter junction. In 2009, he led the discovery of giant electroresistance in ferroelectric tunnel junctions and patented their use as electronic synapses. He also explored novel route, uh, routes for the electrical control of magnetism and spin transport in hybrid oxide metal architectures. Manuel has received several awards, the 2013 EU Materials Prize of the EMRS, 2017 Descartes Huygens Prize, and Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Award of the Humboldt Foundation is the principal investigator of a European Research Council grant to design novel states of matter through electronic correlations. Okay, so this being said, um, I will now let Manuel take over and um, present the first lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you see my screen? Yeah, looks okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so first let me thank uh, Mark and the other organizers for putting together this uh, uh, summer school despite the complications due to the COVID pandemic. And it's a great honor for me to, uh, to give a talk, two talks actually in this school and to give the first talk. So my first talk is going to be about oxide spintronics and uh, it will cover uh, some um, early work from the 60s, 70s, and then some work that we have done uh, in our group. So I apologize, I, I will use, uh, illustrate some of the concept with our own research. So it's a kind of a biased uh, perspective as you, you will see. Um, I, want to, um, I want to thank the people who contributed to the work I will present. I think I'm forgetting a lot of names here. But I want to thank my, uh, my uh, colleagues in the lab, uh, Agnès Barthélemy, Vincent Garcia, Stéphane Fusi, Karim Bozouan, uh, Henri Jaffrez, Alda Fert, and the uh, many postdocs and students that contributed. Also, uh, we, had a, we have a long-standing collaboration with the group of uh, Sergio Valencia and Florent Kronast at the Synchrotron in Berlin, at Bessie, also within Mather in Cambridge, and with uh, uh, from Kuberta, Jean-Vazierans at ICMAB and, and some others that uh, I'm forgetting. So um, this is the outline of the talk. So I will have two main parts. The first part will be about uh, tunneling, so mostly tunnel junctions. So I will start with a brief introduction on quantum mechanical tunneling in solid state and then move on to uh, the first uh, experimental results and then the incorporation of spin uh, into tunneling, spin-dependent tunneling and magnetic tunnel junctions. And then in the third um, subpart, I will um, show you results on um, tunneling devices where uh, the barrier material is not a simple diamagnetic dielectric insulator, but uh, an insulator that has some ferric properties. And as you will see, this can bring about some interesting new functionalities uh, and new uh, physical effects. <coughs> So the second part will be about electric field control of magnetism. So this is a very, very vast field. So I have chosen to highlight only three mechanisms and I will show them quite briefly. So it's more like an introduction to this field. 
So first mechanism will be uh, based on strain effects. So coupling between uh, piezoelectricity and magnetos friction, for instance. Second will be using field effects. So accumulation and depletion of charge to modify the properties of uh, magnetic materials. And the third one will be using exchange coupling, mostly um, through uh, coupling between a multiferroic and a ferromagnet. Okay, so here we go. So first part, tunnel devices. So I, I want to start with this uh, picture that you probably are all familiar with. So this is um, a sketch of the potential profile that you could find in a sandwich combining two metals separated by a thin insulator. Okay, so you have a potential step that is uh, related to the value of the band gap of the insulator. And if you have an electronic wave function that um, uh, you want to, to see crossing the insulator to go from metal one to metal two, in principle, in a classical mechanics, this is not possible because here you have a, a, a barrier height, so you cannot cross. But in a, quantum mechanics, the, through um, tunneling, there is a finite probability that this wave function crosses the insulator and uh, exits the insulator arriving in metal two with a finite but reduced uh, amplitude. So for that, you need the tunnel barrier to be uh, rather thin, okay? Typically a few angstrom of a few nanometers. Otherwise, this exponential decay of the wave function amplitude will lead to a vanishingly small or zero amplitude uh, of the wave function. So this is the tunneling equation. And you see that uh, it incorporates a number of, uh, of terms. The first one uh, has to do with the density of states close to the Fermi level at the bus interfaces in the bus interfaces, meaning interfaces between the first metal and the insulator and interface between the second metal and the insulator. And here you have uh, the matrix tunneling elements, which are functions that depend exponentially on the barrier thickness, which here is called T, and exponentially also on the square root of the tunnel barrier height, which is the height of this potential step here, and something that is called the uh, tunneling effective mass, which is uh, not always a very well described uh, function. Not that it's not directly related to the to the, the effective mass of uh, block electrons, but I will uh, and I will go back uh, to this notion uh, in uh, in a moment. So uh, in the 60s, there was uh, several work, including this work by Simmons, who simplified this equation and arrive at this, uh, this, uh, this expression. And here you see that the, so that's the tunneling current density as a function of the bias voltage. So the bias voltage is applied between the two metals and provides energy for the electrons to tunnel from one metal to the other metal across the barrier. And you see that this um, uh, modified equation or simplified equation in includes the different terms that we've seen before. So now the, sorry, the tunneling, uh, the, the, the thickness of the barrier height is now called D. I apologize for this. And phi is still the, the barrier height, okay? So uh, at uh, very low voltage, so there's several important features from this equation. Huh? So the, at very low voltage, the tunneling current is going to be linear with the voltage. So very low voltage, meaning a few millivolts or lower. And uh, intermediate voltages is going to be proportional to a linear term plus a term that goes as the cube of the voltage. So that the conductance, which is the derivative of the current or the current density over the voltage, is going to be proportional to V square. And this uh, V square dependence of the conductance is uh, one of the hallmarks of, um, of uh, tunneling, okay, direct tunneling. And here is an example of this. So this is a, a result from the 60s in junctions that have two uh, different electrodes. So one electrode is, uh, is aluminum, aluminum metal, and uh, the other electrode is tin. And the uh, tunnel barrier is aluminum oxide. So you see from these conductance curves that we have a very nice parabolic shape, so very nice quadratic dependence 
of the conductance with the with the rise voltage. So this is uh, what you expect from this uh, from, from Simon's model, and there were also other results which are not sh uh, not showing here that uh, demonstrated another hallmark feature of uh, quantum mechanical tunneling is the exponential dependence of the tunneling current with the barrier thickness. So the current decreases exponentially with the barrier thickness. However, uh, you can see here that this uh, parabola is not perfectly centered and its center is actually shifted to a negative bias here. And this is not uh, possible within the simple model of Simmons. And so to take into account this, uh, Brinkman developed a slightly more elaborate model. And here I must say that this shift comes from the fact that the junction is not symmetric. So we have two different metals. And so they have two different work, fu work functions. And so the, bi the tunnel barrier is not uh, rectangular, as I showed in the very simple example uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, but it's actually a trapezoidal, okay? And this causes uh, a shift of the minimum of the conductance. Another uh, element which will turn out to be extremely important and is not taken into account in Simon's model and it's not uh, considered either in Brinkman's, Brinkman's model is the density of state. The effect of the density of state is completely ignored here. And I will show you that this can be very important. So let, let's, let's see how this can be um, uh, introduced. So the first, uh, I think the first demonstration that uh, density of state effects are, are very important in tunneling uh, came from a uh, work from uh, Ivar Jaber from in the 60s. And there's a series of three, I think three uh, PRL papers of about uh, one page. Some are even shorter than one page. And they were very important for the field and that led them to the to uh, Jiver receiving the Nobel Prize a few years later. So uh, Jiver uh, studied the tunnel junctions in which uh, the tunnel barrier was again aluminum oxide, but the electrode was aluminum and lead. And then he worked in two regimes, one regime where uh, both metals are uh, in the normal state and another regime where the metal, the aluminum remains in a normal metal, in normal state, but the lead becomes superconducting. So when lead becomes superconducting, a gap opens around the Fermi level uh, in the density of states of lead, okay? So that in principle, when you are going to send electrons from a normal metal shown here across the barrier to the, the, to the lead, if the energy of the electrons, which is set by the bias voltage that you apply between the two electrodes, if the energy of these electrons is uh, very small, so basically they may arrive in the gap and so they cannot tunnel because there's no uh, state for them to tunnel into. So in this case, there will be no current and only when the voltage is high enough so that the electrons can then tunnel into the density of states of the lead above the gap, where there are states available, then the current will start to be finite. And this is very illustrated, very well illustrated by the experimental results. You see the two ID curves, one in the normal state of lead and one in the superconducting state of lead. In the normal case of lead, you have a linear dependence. As you remember, I told you that at low bias, uh, the current is going to be linear with the voltage. But in the superconducting state, clearly there is no current at very low voltage and only when you exceed a given threshold, which would correspond to the, the band gap of the lead uh, in the superconducting state, well, you, you are able to recover a finite tuning current. So this is a strong deviation uh, uh, from the Siemens and Brickman model that uh, illustrate the importance of the density of states in tunneling uh, effects. So a few years later, uh, in the 70s, uh, Mezavi and Tedro in the, at MIT uh, were started to do similar kind of experiments. And uh, this review from uh, the 90s uh, summarizes most of the, the, the work. And so they were doing the same kind of experiments, but then they applied a magnetic field to uh, basically uh, realize a Zeeman splitting of the density of state of the superconductor. 
So now uh, we have to introduce pins into the, the game and uh, we have to assume that the tunneling current is going to be carried in parallel by a spin up channel and a spin down channel. And we have to assume as well that spin is conserved during the tunneling process, so there's no spin flip. So uh, if we do that, we uh, so you can recognize here the density of state of the lead in the superconducting state, but now there is a magnetic field. So the, the, there's a shift uh, in energy between the spin up and spin down uh, uh, sides of the density of state. So uh, when electrons are going to tunnel, they are not going to be equivalent depending on their spins. Some may enter the gap, some may already uh, arriving above the gap because of, for, the, for the same energy because of the Zeeman splitting. So effectively, uh, if you then now measure the conductance as a function of the, of the bias voltage, and when, when the magnetic field is present, you're going to see this kind of, uh, of uh, curves. Basically, you're going to measure four peaks, and each peak corresponds to the onset of a finite current, similar to what I was showing you. So here you would have one peak, and you have a symmetric peak if you are going to do the experiment at negative bias voltage. But now, because you have a magnetic field applied, basically you are seeing two gaps, one gap for spin down and one gap for spin up. So you have two peaks for positive bias and two peaks for negative bias. And now, if instead of using a uh, normal metal, let's say a paramagnetic metal, like aluminum or gold, you use a ferromagnetic metal, uh, then things are going to be different and very interesting because uh, in this case, the amount of electrons tunneling with spin up or spin down is not going to be the same because in the, in the ferromagnet, you have a spin polarization of the density of set at the Fermi level. So here, for instance, you're going to have more spin up than spin down. And so you're going to have more current coming from spin up than from spin down. And so these four peaks, which were uh, equivalent two by two because of the uh, equal number of uh, spin down state and spin up states, are not going to be equivalent anymore when the metal is a ferromagnet. And so you're going to have this kind of, of, of curves. Okay? And by uh, fitting or even simply by measuring the relative heights of these peaks, you are going to be able to determine the relative imbalance of spin up with respect to spin down in the density of state of the ferromagnet. And this is called the spin polarization. So spin polarization is the relative difference between um, uh, the density of state at spin up and spin down at the Fermi level in the ferromagnet. So this uh, tunneling experiments using the so-called uh, Mesovitedro method uh, was, I think, the first transport method to determine spin polarization. And uh, talking about spintronics, this is very important because spin polarization is probably the key quantity governing the amplitude of spintronics effects. So these are experimental results uh, obtained in uh, junctions in which uh, the superconductor was aluminum. So aluminum can become superconducting, but at lower temperature than lead. So typically around one, one Kelvin or, or lower. And uh, the barrier is again in most of these curves and most of, of these data, aluminum oxides. And the ferromagnet are, as you can see, uh, nickel, cobalt, iron, or their alloys. And you can see from the data here, uh, 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 the result from a junction with a nickel. And you can recognize that at high field, we have clearly four peaks. You can look at these uh, white dots here. You can really see these four peaks. At zero field, we only see two peaks because there is no Zeeman splitting in the uh, superconductor. And so the spin up and spin down currents uh, are uh, adding uh, each other, okay? And so they don't contribute different peaks. They are superimposed this year. So you can see also on the, on the right hand side on this table that the, the number of, of uh, um, the value of the spin polarization uh, ranges between about 30 to 50, 55% with transition metals. Okay, so it's quite large. I mean that uh, you have uh, um, uh, two spin up for one pin down, basically, in these kind of uh, systems. And uh, you also see data for oxides. 
So that leads me, so far what I was telling you is more general uh, uh, metal spintronics or uh, generalities on, on tunneling. And now I'm entering more the oxide spintronics part. And you see these first results of measurement of spin polarization in strontium ruthenate, which as you know is a fur magnet, and has a negative spin polarization. Okay, that's the only negative number in this table. And uh, lanthanum strontium manganite, LSMO, which has a very high spin polarization, 78%. And as I will show you, it is actually, uh, can be actually even higher than that. So now let's move to magnetic tunnel junction. So we will now uh, forget about the superconducting uh, electrodes and the junctions uh, I will describe now uh, involve two ferromagnetic electrodes separated by an insulator. So the very first experimental result on uh, magnetic tunnel junctions is uh, shown here. It's from um, this paper from 1975 from Michel Julier, who was a professor in uh, Rennes, in Brittany, in France. And he was working with this kind of structure, so iron, germanium, cobalt. And the curve here is the first curve that uh, indicates a possible uh, tunnel magnetic resistance effect shows the difference, the, the difference in the conductance between zero magnetic field and high magnetic field, normalized by, I think, the zero magnetic field value, okay? So you see that at zero bias voltage or low bias voltage, this difference, sorry, this difference is about 14% and decreases strongly as voltage increases. So this can be taken as a first indication of tunnel magnetic resistance, but it's not very conclusive. The first conclusive results uh, came about uh, 20 years later in two groups, so the group of uh, Miyazaki in Japan and the group of Jagdish Mudera at MIT, uh, same group as the group of Mesa and Tedro. And uh, this was with junctions using aluminum oxide as a barrier, which is a very good insulator. And you can see uh, what we call a TM marker. So we have a strong variation of the resistance by, uh, as you see, the magnetic field. The resistance is low at uh, high magnetic field. And then as you decrease and you reach negative values, you get a strong increase and then a decrease. And the curve is basically symmetric as you go back to positive magnetic field. So how can we understand the shape of these TMR curves? I think this is uh, pretty straightforward. Maybe you, you know about this already. So this is another curve, which is uh, has a slightly higher magnetic resistance and uh, very flat uh, values of the resistance on top of these two plateaus. So uh, to get TMR, you need to combine two ferromagnets that have uh, ether resist loops with different magnetic coercive fields. So that when we sweep, when you sweep the magnetic field, there is a range in field where uh, one, uh, basically where you have an anti-parallel alignment of the magnetization of the two ferromagnets. So in this case, you know, of these two uh, ferromagnets with these two uh, hysteresis cycles, in this range here of field, the, this one will switch, will have switched and the other one will have not switched yet. So basically you reach this anti-parallel alignment and then the resistance is going to be higher. And you get the same symmetric behavior as you sweep the field back towards positive values. <coughs> so this can be understood uh, quite simply, again, in the frame of spin-dependent tunneling, again, assuming that you have uh, two um, uh, channels in parallel, one channel of current uh, carried by uh, spin-up and another channel carried by spin-down, and you assume as well that you have no spin-flips. The spin memory is conserved in the process. So suppose that you, uh, you work with this kind of, of system, you have this uh, spin dependent density of states. You see that for the spin up channel here, you have a lot of states available at the Fermi level in the first and the second electrodes. So this will lead to a large uh, tunneling current and a small tunneling current for the spin down. But because the current is flowing in parallel, you will uh, end up with a large current and a low tunnel resistance. If you reverse the magnetization of one of the ferromagnets, you will reach the anti-parallel state, and then you will have moderate 
uh, currents carried by spin up and spin down. So overall, you will have a lower current and a larger resistance. Okay, this explains the tunnel melt resistance effect. So you can uh, relate the amplitude of the conductance in the parallel state and in the anti-parallel state to the density of states of the ferromagnets. And you can arrive at this expression, which is uh, called the Julia formula, which was included in the first paper of 1975 of Julia. <coughs> and uh, this formula states that the TMR defined as the different the ratio of the resistance between uh, basically you, you measure the resistance in the anti-parallel state and in the parallel state you make the difference and you normalize it by the resistance in the parallel state at high field that's the tmr and uh, this is uh, related with the spin polarization of the electrodes and the spin polarization as i've mentioned before is the ratio of the difference between the density of state for spin up and spin down normalized by the sum. Okay. So if you know the spin polarization of a ferromagnet, you can directly estimate the TMR that you can get with it. Or reversibly, if you measure the TMR uh, in a magnetic tunnel junctions, you can uh, extract back the value of the spin polarization. So from this formula, basically, it's quite clear that if you want to have a large CMR, you should try to aim for materials with the highest spin polarization possible. And these materials are called half metals. And I will show you now what this means. So this is the density of states of a normal ferromagnet. So you have uh, states present at the Fermi level for both spin up and spin down with a given imbalance. But uh, in this case, for instance, you will have a spin polarization or maybe 50%. However, if you have a different band structure, maybe you have a larger uh, exchange splitting or more narrow bands, uh, you can have a total spin polarization of the density of states, meaning that you have states available at the family level just for um, one spin direction, here spin up, and there's a gap uh, for spin down. So uh, this is why these materials are called half metals, because they are uh, metallic for one spin direction and insulating for the other spin directions and they should not be confused with semi-metals okay this is completely different so as i've shown you most uh, transition metal ferromagnets have spin polarization that does not exceed about 50 percent but uh, oxides are interesting because there's a number of compounds in which this spin polarization can be much higher and this is a, a list of such compounds. Chromium oxide, uh, Fe3O4, which is magnetite, manganite, in particular LSMO, and double perovskite. So there's some other compounds, but these are the most uh, important, I think. So chromium oxide has uh, a TC of about 400 Kelvin. It, uh, it is quite difficult to grow because the most stable valence of chromium is going to be 3 plus, and here you want to have chromium 4 plus, so it's not uh, very easy to make. But uh, Mesovetidro experiments show the very la large value of spin polarization, uh, about uh, 80, 95%. Um, fe 304 was, I think, the first material that was pr predicted to be. Um, uh, half metallic in the early 80s, I think in 1984. And um, it is expected to be half metallic, but again, it's quite difficult to grow in the single crystalline form because of the presence of antiphase boundaries. And uh, there were results showing uh, spin polarization values of about 80% using photo emission. But for magnetic tunnel junction, I think the best results were never much more than 50%. LSMO is a uh, uh, perovskite. It's relatively easy to grow by PLD or, or MBE or sputtering. And uh, early on, there were some results showing a uh, large uh, spin polarization using a spin dependent photo emission around 1995%. And uh, this double perovskite, strontium iron molybdenum oxide, they became popular at the, uh, at the end of the 90s after a, a very important paper by the group of uh, Yoshito Kura. And um, these compounds, th there's a whole family of these double perovskites. 
Several are predicted to be half metallic, and the advantage is that they have quite high TC, higher than, uh, than LSMO, higher than perovskites. They can reach maybe 600 or 700 degrees. They are really relatively difficult to grow as well. And there are some reports of relatively high spin polarization. So I want to focus now mostly on manganides because I think that's where the compound that has been the most studied in this context and also the compound that we have been doing quite a bit of work on, on these materials. So this is a perovskite. You can see here the, the sketch of a simple perovskite structure. So manganese sits at the, uh, at the edge of this uh, cube, uh, cubic unit cell. Uh, at the corners of the cubic unit cell, it's surrounded by a cage of oxygen octahedra. And at the center here, you have lanthanum or strontium. And uh, by varying the relative ratio of lanthanum and strontium, you can change the valence of manganese from three plus to four plus. And this phase diagram shows you the properties of this uh, lanthanum strontium manganite compounds. Basically at zero doping, so lanthanum manganite is an antiferromagnetic insulator. As you introduce uh, strontium, you <coughs> you establish double exchange and so the material becomes uh, uh, ferromagnetic and metallic and reaches a maximum TC of about 360k uh, for doping levels around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. <coughs> Sorry. So this is the spin polarized photoemission work I was telling you uh, about before. And this work from 1998 showed that there was a finite uh, signal for spin up and zero signal for spin down meaning that the compound was half metallic. Then uh, we and others moved to uh, integrate LSMO as tunnel junctions. So basically combining two LSMO electrodes with a strontium titanate tunnel barrier. And there was a number of results uh, before that paper we published in 2003, but uh, already showing a large uh, TMR. When this one, we reach a very high value of TMR of almost 2,000%. So this is, a, you can tell, much higher than the TMR obtained with transition metals, which was peaking at about 50%. <coughs> so from this uh, value of the TMR, you can use Julia formula and extract out the value of the spin polarization, which here is, is more than 95%. I must say that this is at uh, 4 Kelvin, so at, and at room temperatures, I will show you, unfortunately, the TMR of LSMO junction is vanishing this small. You may wonder why the shape of the TMR curve is so weird. This is because we had an antiferromagnet uh, cobalt oxide on top of the top electrode to induce exchange bias, so a shift of the coercive field of the top electrode. And the exchange uh, coupling was not great, so we didn't have a very nice plateau, but we were able to reach this small plateau here with a large effect. So this is the, now the bias dependence of the TMR. So this is a very use, useful uh, technique to um, uh, gain insight into the so this is now normalized. So at low, uh, very low bias, you get values typically of a few, few hundreds, maybe 1,000%. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and you can see that we can distinguish three regimes in this, uh, in this dependence. So there's the first regime where the TMR is going to decrease quite sharply, and this occurs over maybe 100, 150 millivolts. And this is believed to be due to electron magnon scattering or excitation of magnons by the tunneling electrons. And this uh, usually is associated with a flip of the spins of the tunneling electrons. And so this effectively reduces the um, spin polarization of the, of the tunneling electrons and the TMR as a result decreases as well. Eventually, so a little bit, uh, if you increase the bias voltage further, you reach some kind of, uh, of kink or maybe some kind of plateau, and then the TMR keeps on decreasing again. So this uh, plateau uh, was predicted by, uh, in this paper by Bratkowski, uh, who calculated just this, the, the bias dependence of the TMR in junction using half metals. 
So uh, let me uh, say, maybe I forgot to say that, that if you have a perfect half metal with a 100% spin, uh, spin polarization, you should expect uh, infinite, infinite TMR at zero bias, okay? So you should get millions and billions of percents. Effectively, it's never like that because you never have a perfectly perfect, a perfectly uh, perfect half metal. But if you decrease a little bit the spin polarization uh, in the calculations, what Barkowski found is that indeed you should have a plateau at uh, zero voltage. So he's not considering at all these uh, electromagnetic processes. But then eventually you should get some kind of, uh, of kink and then a decrease. And this kink, this inflection point, reflects the presence of a gap in the spin down subband. So basically, it corresponds to the energy where your electrons are going to be able to reach the spin down band. So let's have a look here on the right at, uh, let's say, low bias voltage. The electrons uh, can tunnel only into the spin up band. They don't have enough energy to reach the spin down band, which is, as I told you, uh, the, the minimum of this uh, spin down connection band is separated from the Fermi level by a given uh, energy gap. But when you in increase the, the bias voltage, then they may have enough energy to access these states. And then, of course, the, the effective spin polarization is going to decrease. So you can do a conductance measurements and, and, and differential conductance measurements to uh, detect the onset of tunneling into this uh, speed down, uh, spin down uh, uh, subband. So we can measure the minority gap, uh, spin minority gap in, in LSMO, and we found a number of about 380 millivolts, uh, consistent with a measurement done by Ricardo Bertaco using spin polarized inverse photo emission. So uh, just, uh, just like when you do STM or uh, spin, uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy, you can use the spectroscopic nature of tunneling to gain insight onto the electronic structure of your materials. And here it can be done in a spin dependent way. So this was about the bias dependence. Now let's have a look at the temperature dependence of the TMR. <coughs> so these are some results from our group. So we, we combine <laughs> electrodes with different uh, tunneling barriers. So some titanate, TiO2, lanthanum aluminate. You see that at low, uh, this is all at low temperature, typically for Kelvin. We have uh, TMR reaching a few hundred percent. Uh, maybe we have uh, two hundred percent for LAO. In some junctions, you had even more than that, up to one thousand percent, if I remember. But if we measure the the same curve at different temperatures, we see that the TMR for all three systems decreases with temperature and becomes basically zero at room temperature. So this is quite disappointing. But um, what we wanted to to show with these experiments is to gain a little bit more insight into the, the, the temperature dependence of the spin polarization <coughs> of the um, LSMO at these different interfaces. So the, the three um, curves here with the green, blue, and, uh, and brown symbols are is the spin polarization extracted from this data, okay? And the blue curve is the spin polarization measured by a spin dependent photo emission of a surface of LSMO. And uh, this was measured earlier than uh, quite early on in the, in the study of these tunnel junctions. And um, basically, the message here is that you can see that the spin polarization of the surface decays much faster than the spin polarization of the interfaces. Okay. You, the, at the interface, basically, you have uh, a decay that resembles the decay of the magnetization. The red curve is the magnetization, but with a reduced TC reduced by maybe 50 Kelvin. But it's, it's still much less fast than the decay of the spin polarization of the interface. And this probably due to the fact that at the surface, you don't have a continuity of the manganese uh, oxygen octaedral glossoblatis, and so the magnetism is more disturbed than at an interface with these oxide barriers. 
Okay, so uh, at the time when we were working with uh, uh, manganese junctions, the record values of TMR for uh, at room temperature with uh, junctions involving ferromagnetic transition metals like cobalt or cobalt iron, the maximum value was around 50-60%. And there was a very important uh, finding uh, in arising from a theoretical prediction that came in 2004 that pointed out pointed to the key importance of the nature of the barium material and also of the crystallinity of the barium materials. And you can see here results uh, co that compare uh, TMR data on, uh, <coughs> on junctions with a amorphous aluminum oxide barrier and here with a crystalline MGO barrier. And you can see that with MGO barrier, the TMR reaches here 350%. So there's a huge increase of the TMR at room temperature using these epitaxial MGO barriers, okay? So why is that? Oh, I must mention here that the shape of the TMR curve is not the one I was showing you before, the nice symmetric with two plateaus. This is because here again, on one of the electrodes, there is an antiferromagnet uh, that pins its magnetization due to a change bias, okay? So basically here you see the switching of only one of the two electrodes and the other is fixed due to the exchange bias from the antiferromagnet. So why is the TMR so high uh, when one uses epitaxial and geo barriers? So this has to do with uh, the electronic structure of the MGO barrier and also the electronic structure of the ferromagnets, iron or, or cobalt, BCC iron or BCC cobalt. So let's have a look here first at the, the, the band structure of BCC iron. So this is maybe not very easy to see, but let me take you through that. So here at zero, you have the family level. And in black, you have the bands for spin up and in gray, you have the bands for spin down. So you see that at the family level, basically for spin up, you only have this state labeled delta one state with the, the delta one symmetry, okay? On the other hand, for spin down, you have uh, states present with delta five, delta two prime and delta two symmetry, okay? So now let's have a look at uh, MGO. So in MGO, in this uh, calculation, this prediction by the group of Bill Butler, uh, it was predicted that uh, states with a delta one symmetry or delta five symmetry or delta two, delta two prime symmetries will be transmitted with very different uh, exponential attenuation rates depending on the symmetry. So you see, for instance, that the delta one states are very weakly attenuated when they cross the MGO barrier. So this space here is the MGO barrier, which is maybe seven or eight units Celsius. The delta five and the, the, the delta two prime states are much more strongly attenuated, okay? So because in the iron for spin up, you only have delta one states, these states, and you don't have delta one state for spin down, that's very important the delta one state will be uh, um, predominantly transmitted by the MGO barrier so that effectively at the output of the MGO barrier, you will only have delta one states present, almost only have delta one state present. And because these delta one states are only present for the spin up, you will only have spin up states. And so this kind of symmetry filtering of the tunneling wave functions is going to result in a very strong increase in the effective uh, spin polarization of the tunneling current. So here you have symmetry filtering that enhances very strongly spin polarization, okay? And this is just a nice small chart that is not completely up to date, but uh, the, the maximum number that came after that are well, not much higher than what we have there in 2006. So this is just to illustrate how the introduction of MGO barriers led to very dramatic increase of the TMR ratio at room temperature. So this was with aluminum oxide barrier. And then with MGO barriers, you have very different slope. And uh, today, I think the maximum values are still around 600% at room temperature and maybe 1000% at room temperature. Okay, so um, up to now, 
the everything I've shown you in terms of um, tunneling junctions, tunnel junctions involved barrier materials which were diamagnetic and dielectric. So we've seen aluminum oxide, you can do with strontium titanate, MgO. These are all uh, diamagnetic and dielectric compounds. But if you come back, we come back to this uh, slide I've shown you, we see that uh, in addition to the density of state, which is, as I hope I've convinced you, very important in determining the physics of tunneling, especially in spin dependent tunneling. In addition to that, we have these matrix elements, tunneling matrix elements, in which uh, the tunneling current, through which the tunneling current is going to depend exponentially on the barrier parameters. So if one could find a way to act on the barrier parameters, the barrier height, the barrier thickness, or the tunneling effective mass, which is somehow related to the this, this decay rates of the wave functions that I was showing you for uh, NGO, if one could act on that with external stimuli, magnetic field, electric field, then potentially you could, add, you could reach very strong variation of the tunneling currents because of this exponential dependence. <coughs> So um, the idea here that uh, we had and some others before us, including Jagdish Mudera, would be to uh, introduce uh, ferric orders in the tunneling barriers. So this is just a reminder of the different kind of ferric orders that exist in nature. There's basically four of them. Ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism are the most uh, stud well studied and most well known. In ferroelectricity, you have a stereotic dependence of the order parameter, which is polarization with the electric field. And for magnet, magnetization is stereotically dependent with the magnetic field. You also have ferroelasticity, where strain is, uh, is a function of stress. And then you have ferrotroidicity. Okay. Uh, let's focus on ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism. And uh, as you know, some compounds called multiferroics. Uh, can uh, be at the same time um, ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. Uh, although there are very few ferroelectric and ferromagnetic materials. So in this case, you have the coexistence of ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism. And if you have a coupling between the two called magnetoelectric coupling, you can hope to control magnetization by electric field and polarization by magnetic field. Okay. Sometimes these compounds are called intrinsic multiferroics. And to be um, fair, uh, most of multiferroics are not ferromagnetic. They are anti-ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. You can also design so-called artificial or composite multiferroics in which you would uh, take one ferroelectric material and one ferromagnetic material. And you can build, for instance, an interface between the two and at the interface, you may expect to have a magnetoelectric coupling that would also enable you to uh, control magnetism by electric field or ferricity by magnetic fields. So uh, ferric orders and in particular multiferric systems are good for data storage because uh, you have these remnant states and in multiferics you have two for the price of one. And uh, so you can increase the, the storage density and the coupling between the orders brings some interesting um, uh, new handles to uh, write uh, information. And I will come back to that on the second part of the talk when I talk about electric field control of magnetism. So if one uses um, ferric materials as um, tunneling biomaterials as tunneling materials. Uh, you can maybe uh, utilize tunneling to get a very efficient uh, means to read the stored information, the information stored by the other parameter in the ferric biomaterial. So let's start with ferromagnetic barrier materials. So <clears throat> of course, because you want the ferric material to be a tunnel barrier, it has to be insulating. So here, let's talk about ferromagnetic insulators used, very thin layers of ferromagnetic insulators used as tunnel barrier. These devices are called pin filters, and I, I will uh, tell you why. So here, the junction is as follows. So you have a ferromagnet, 
as one of the electrodes. You have a non-magnetic metal as the other electrode, and the barrier is now a ferromagnetic insulator. Okay, so you have two ferromagnetic materials, but before you had two ferromagnetic electrodes and a, let's say a diamagnetic barrier. Here, the ferromagnetism is in the electrode and in the barrier. And of course, you want to device your system so that you can reach, you can switch between parallel and anti-parallel magnetic configurations. So when electrons are tunneling from the non-magnetic metal across the ferromagnetic insulator, well, they are going to see two different barrier heights, different depending on their spin. Because as I told you, the barrier height is related to the band gap somehow. And in a ferromagnetic insulator, you have exchange splitting of the bands and you would have a different value for the band gap for spin up and for spin down. So you will have different barrier heights for spin up and for spin down. And so you will filter out spins, uh, filter out electrons depending on their spins. In this case, for instance, the spin up electrons, which have a much higher current because the uh, barrier height for spin up is lower than for spin down. And here, if you have a ferromagnetic half metal as the, as the counter electrode, you have a large current. In this case, you have a large current in principle for the spin down, but they cannot tunnel into the half metal here. Okay? So you filter out electrons according to the spins due to the presence of two barrier heights depending on the spin in the ferromagnetic insulator barrier. And this is why these devices are called spin filters. So if the barrier is sufficiently thick, this filtering effect will be extremely efficient. And <clears throat> at the output of the barrier, you can well achieve almost fully spin progress current while you started with a non progress current with this non-magnetic metal as your electrode. So you expect to have large GMR. So the first demonstration of spin filtering with ferromagnetic barriers was again um, uh, given by uh, Mudera, and he used the Mezavacedro technique. So again, using aluminum, superconducting aluminum as a spin detector in the magnetic field to induce Zeeman splitting. And europium sulfide was the ferromagnetic insulator. So there's a number of ferromagnetic insulators in the europium carcogonide family, europium sulfide has a TC of 16 Kelvin. There's also europium oxide, which has a TC of 69 Kelvin and was used later by Mudera as well. And here the other electrode is gold. So you can see from this curve that um, for some uh, magnetic field, you recognize the four peak structure that we had when we were tunneling from a spin polarized ferromagnet. Uh, but mostly you just have two peaks, okay? Why do you have two peaks? That's because the spin polarization is extremely high. It's around 90%. So the, the peak corresponding to spin down are almost completely washed out. So from this data, one can extract a spin polarization value of about 90%. Um, this is another result in which uh, this is a spin filter junction. So here we don't have ferromagnet, uh, don't have superconducting aluminum. Uh, gadolinium is used as the ferromagnetic electrode. So gadolinium is a ferromagnet, as, as you know, with a relatively small spin polarization, but it was, its growth was compatible with the uh, europium sulfide. So you can see these TMR curves reaching about 100%. So they look a little bit strange, but uh, they were kind of reproducible from that paper. And the, the let's say their non-orthodox shape, the authors argue is due to um, um, due to domains being present to the, the uh, displacement of domain walls in the ferromagnetic barrier. The TMR is about 100% and this can be, um, uh, a spin filtering efficiency of about 90% can be extracted by, from these numbers. So this is uh, nice, but uh, these europium oxide, com europium carcogonide compounds are a bit difficult to work with because they are not very compatible with many other compounds and they have low TC. So in oxides, there's a number of um, ferromagnets and ferrimagnets with high TCs. And uh, 
several groups, including ourselves, started to work on spinel ferrites, which are ferry, ferry magnets insulators with a TC of about 800 Kelvin as uh, spin filter barriers. So here, these are some results combining LSMO, nickel, ferrite, and gold. You see a TMR curve of about 50% TMR. This is with cobalt ferrite and cobalt and platinum as the non-magnetic electrode. And this was at low temperature. And here there's a, some finite TMR at room temperature, about 3%. So it works, but the efficiency is not great, possibly because of growth issues to grow these very thin layers of spinel ferrites. <clears throat> so this was about ferromagnetic barriers. Now uh, let's see what happens when we use a ferroelectric barrier. So we will forget about spintronic for maybe 10 minutes and then we will come back to it. So now let's use a ferroelectric as a tunnel barrier. So we, we, we don't need ferromagnetic electrodes, we just use non-magnetic electrodes. And here the two electrodes have to be made of two different metals, okay? One metal would be a good metal, metal two, and the metal one would be a bad metal, let's say with a, with a lower carrier density. This is important because the, um, it involves the screening length, sc screening of the polarization charges from the ferroelectric, and uh, we need metals with two different screening lengths. So what happens when the barrier is made uh, ferroelectric? While you are in the ferroelectric, you have polarization charges that will uh, screen electrons in the, in the, in the metals, okay? Uh, and so this, uh, this um, accumulation or depletion of charges will occur over a finite thickness, the Thomas Fermi uh, uh, screening length. And uh, it can be typically a few angstrom of a few nanometers, depending on the metals. And um, if the screening is poor, you, you will have an added potential at the, at, at the interface between the metal and the barrier, okay? And the screening is good, this uh, potential will be small. So if you use two different metals, you will basically induce a asymmetry of your, uh, you will distort the potential profile by inducing an asymmetry that will result in a modified average barrier height, which is shown here with this dotted purple line. If now you switch the direction of the polarization, the asymmetry will reverse and the value of the average um, barrier height will also change. So basically, in these devices, you expect to modulate the value of the average barrier height when you switch the polarization direction with an electric field. And because again, uh, the barrier height comes as an exponential factor into the tunneling current equation, as you switch, you expect to have a large change of resistance, and this is called tunnel electroresistance. So here I'm showing some uh, TM image of devices we, we made to uh, study this effect. So we use LSMO as our bottom electrode. It's magnetic, but let's uh, forget about its magnetic properties for now. And barium titanate, which was our ferroelectric, and everything was grown onto neodymium gallate which uh, imposes a, a large strain on barium titanate and uh, enhances its ferroelectric behavior, especially at low thickness. And then here we had an iron electrode, but again, forget about the magnetism of iron for the moment, especially because the next slide I will show you results without a bottom, without a top electrode. So just LSMO and barium titanate. So first, when you work with uh, uh, ferroelectric tunnel junctions, because the barium titanate ferroelectric is very thin because it has to be uh, compatible with tunneling. Uh, you want to make sure that your ferroelectric is ferroelectric, okay? Because just like for ferromagnets, when you decrease the thickness of a ferroelectric, ferroelectricity tends to be weakened and eventually disappear at very low thicknesses. So to test ferroelectricity, we use a technique called piezo response force uh, microscopy, uh, which, um, uh, is shown here. So basically it's a contact mode AFM technique. Uh, and uh, with the conductive AFM, we apply a voltage, AC voltage between the tip and the bottom electrode across the ferroelectric. And then we probe uh, the ferroelectric through its piezoelectric response. 
So basically, we apply uh, AC voltage, and uh, when the AC voltage is applied, the ferroelectric will uh, expand or contract uh, due to piezoelectricity, and uh, the response will be in phase or out of phase depending on the direction of the polarization, polarization up or polarization down. So if you scan a given area in the ferroelectric and you pick up the phase of the output signal, you are able to tell if the polarization is up or down. And these are the results for a one nanometer thick barium titanate at room temperature. So here we had first uh, applied voltages to pull the ferroelectric along these stripes, up or down. And you see when we read out the piezo response phase, we see a nice contrast uh, uh, with these uh, clear stripe domains. And uh, the phase contrast is uh, the expected one about 180 degrees and we can write on top of this uh, array and arrays and write again and this is stable for many days so in principle this is a good indication that the material is ferroelectric um, we because these these layers are very thin we are also able to measure the um, tunneling current across them using an afm tip so we use conductive afm and uh, here are the, the results uh, in the virgin state for one, two, and three nanometers of barium titanate. You see that we have finite uh, resistance values, and the resistance increases as we increase the thickness of barium titanate and increases exponentially as we expect for tunneling. So these barium titanate films are good tunnel barriers, they're for electric. So now we can uh, directly probe what are the resistance. Uh, varies when we measure a resist a value a, a region where the polarization is pointing down or pointing up and these are the results you can see for instance for two nanometers we have a strong uh, difference of resistance uh, depending on whether we 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 measure a region which is pulled up or down and the variation here is about two orders of magnitude corresponding to about ten thousand percent of tunnel electro resistance and it's even higher for three nanometers so we have tunnel electro resistance, but it's even giant in these devices. And you can compare this with the best values of TMR at room temperature, even with these MGO barriers, it's never more than 1000%. So this is a very, very large effect. So a few years later, we uh, uh, build solid state uh, ferroelectric tunnel junctions, meaning that we uh, uh, deposited top electrodes on top of the barium titanate. So here again, we are using a ferromagnet, but uh, don't pay attention to that for the moment. Uh, so this is gold and, and, and cobalt and gold or cobalt and platinum or different metals. And then we can use, um, these are very small, typically a few hundred of nanometers. And we can measure the tunnel electro resistance, the resistant response by contacting them with a conductive tip. So, um, we uh, this is the connective tip and first we can check that the the tunnel the tunnel device the, the barium titanate is for electric in the tunnel device and these are piezo response measurements piezo response loops that mimic the polarization loop and indicate that for electricity is uh, maintained is preserved when the barium titanate is encapsulated in the lsm1 cobalt electrodes then we can measure the resistance after applying various uh, voltage pulses typically uh, 20, 10 to 20 nan nanosecond pulses. So we, we apply a first pulse, we can measure the resistance. We have a high value of about 10 megaohms. And then we pull, we apply a different voltage to pull the ferroelectric up. And we have a change of about two orders of magnitude. And we can do this many times. On different devices, we can check the endurance uh, the endurance in, uh, uh, in other devices, which are not shown here, could reach about uh, 1 million to 10 million uh, cycles. So this is very robust. And um, there's a number of advantages with these devices. They are low power. Uh, they are all electrical. They can be scaled down. And now there's a lot of activity uh, on ferroelectric tunnel junctions using afnium oxide or afnium zirconium oxide as tunnel barriers integrated with CMOS and um, especially I think Toshiba in Japan is working uh, intensely on that. 
So this is again the piezoelectric loops, and here you can see the resistance loop. So here that's the resistance measured at low voltage as a function of the amplitude of the pulses that we applied before reading to uh, set the junction in a given ferroelectric state. So what is interesting is that we have these two orders of magnitude resistance change, but you can also see that we have intermediate resistance states as well. And this is uh, maybe uh, better shown on this graph. This is the same kind of curve where we have uh, uh, two uh, maximum resistance values. And these are so kind of, kind of uh, minor loops where we don't go all the way to the maximum right voltage. We stop uh, before at maybe two volts or three volts. And then you see that we can uh, stabilize um, basically any, almost any intermediate state. So we have a, a pseudo continuous resistance variation of the resistance which we can set in these devices. And this defines uh, memory steel behavior. And uh, I'm not going to go into details, but um, I think it was uh, mentioned briefly by Mark that these memory stores are electronic analog of the synapses of our brain. And as a result, these ferroelectric tunnel junctions are interesting devices for uh, neuromorphic computing. And we have an activity on this uh, in, in the lab. So one question that we ask ourselves when we got these results is what's the origin of the intermediate states? So maybe you know that in um, memory stores, in other oxide memory stores, for instance, based on, on titanium oxide, uh, the um, uh, different resistance values are associated with different levels of oxygen uh, vacancy uh, or different positions of the oxygen uh, vacancies. So basically you apply voltage and you generate oxygen vacancy or you move oxygen vacancies between across the TiU2 layer between the electrodes. So here we think that the, the mechanism is different and uh, I want to show you this. And for that, we, we had to, uh, to, to uh, devise a setup. This was done by Vincent Garcia and Stéphane Fusi to uh, uh, pull the junctions, measure the resistance level, and also image the ferroelectric domains in the barium titanate film through the top electrode. And this, the results are shown here. So this is uh, the typical resistance versus voltage curve. And here we are in this state where the resistance is low. And this is the domain configuration where the, the, the polarization is pointing up. When we apply a, a voltage of uh, 1.4 volts, we see that we have the nucleation of down domains. And eventually, these down domains saturate the, the, the junction. And we have a fully reversed state. And the resistance reaches a maximum value. And we can come back to the initial state. So there seems to be a clear connection between the resistance value and the domain po population. So we can analyze this and we can extract from the images the fraction of down domains and plot the resistance as a function of this fraction. And we see that we have a nice systematic trend, which we can even fit with a very simple model, uh, considering that up and down domains have different specific resistance and only the relative area of one with respect to the others is uh, given the, the is setting the resistance of the device. So this uh, provides a new mechanism for memory state behavior, which is uh, based on ferroelectric domain switching and not based on uh, you know oxygen vacancies or defects. This was on barium titanate. A few years later, we uh, did the same kind of experiment with bismuth ferrite, and again we have the correlation between the domain structure and the resistance. Okay, so now let me move back to this uh, slide. And I want to show you that we can now combine ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity in the tunnel barrier to uh, design effectively multi ferroelectric tunnel junctions. So this is quite difficult because there are very few, as I said, ferromagnetic ferroelectrics. Maybe you've seen this uh, chart before. This is a Venn diagram that shows um, let's say magnetically, magnetically polarizable compounds and electrically polarizable compounds. And here you have ferromagnets, here you have ferroelectrics, and there are extremely few ferromagnetic ferroelectrics, okay? So bismuth manganite was believed to be one of them. Cobalt chromide is also one at low temperature, 
And below the Verve transition, uh, FE304, which is a well-known ferry magnet, is also ferroelectric. So we work with lanthanum doped bispuit manganite. Uh, so bismuth manganite is quite difficult to grow. Lanthanum helps a little bit to get better films. And we could show that these films are, can be at the same time magnetic and ferroelectric. So ferroelectric at room temperature, magnetic below 100 K. And we integrated them into tunnel junctions. So we had LSMO, LBMO, gold tunnel junctions. And there we had the combination of spin filtering leading to the, T, the TMR effect and electroresistance leading to this um, ferroelectricity leading to electroresistance, uh, which is shown here by the shift between these two TMR curves. So we have basically four resistance states that are encoded by the magnetization and polarization in the, in the multiferroic barrier, okay? So there are more compounds with which you can actually do this uh, uh, design is artificial multiferroic junction. So here you can just combine a ferroelectric with a ferromagnet. And for instance, barium titanate and gold or uh, barium titanate and iron are good examples. And these are calculations from uh, Evgeny symbol. Uh, this is the density of states, spin dependent density of states of BTO iron. This is the last titanium plane in red. In gray, it's uh, away from the interface. And that's the first iron plane. And, that's, uh, and the gray is away from the interface. And the red is for the two polarization direction of the barium titanate. So you see that you have uh, finite spin polarization of iron, of course, and but it depends on the ferroelectric state. Okay, if the BTO is pointing towards or away from the uh, iron, the density of states is modified. This is shown here in this uh, highlight. So we use this junction iron barium titanate uh, LSMO, which I've shown you before, and then we cool down to low temperature and we measure the TMR and we get TMR, negative TMR, because iron has a negative spin polarization at the interface with barium titanate. And you can see that not only do we have a shift of the resistance value, so this is tunnel electroresistance, but also we have a change of the value of the TMR. TMR is about 13% in your 30, 33%. And this reflects, we think, this prediction from symbol, which is the ferroelectric control of spin polarization. There's another consequence of this, and another, it's also in the prediction by this paper by Evgeny, is that uh, you expect to, um, uh, at the interface, titanium is going to acquire a finite uh, spin dependent density of state, which should result in an induced magnetic moment, which we also observed using uh, XMCD and XRMS measurements at BC. So you can see here the gray curve is a hysteretic curve, hysteresis curve at room temperature of the uh, titanium moment. So in these devices, we not only have ferroelectric control of spin polarization and TMR, but also interface induced multifericity at room temperature. Right, so this concludes the first part, and now I want to move on to the second part. I think I've touched a little bit onto that in the last few slides, electric field control of magnetism. Okay, so this is a possibly not completely exhaustive list of magnetic properties that you may want to control by applying electric fields. You have magnetic anisotropy. Here, for instance, you can switch from uh, easy axis to hard axis. You have exchange bias. So exchange bias is a shift of the hysteresis group induced by a fer an antiferromagnet. If you control the spin structure in the antiferromagnet, maybe you can switch the direction of the exchange bias. You can also maybe control the amplitude of the magnetic moments. You can also control magnetic order, going from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic or from ferromagnetic to antiferromagnetic. You can maybe control the Curie temperature so that when you operate at a given temperature here, your matter will be either ferromagnetic or paramagnetic. And as I've shown in the previous slides, you can also control spin polarization. 
This can be done in single phase multiferroics or magnetoelectrics, or most often it's done in composite or artificial multiferroics that would combine a ferroelectric or piezoelectric or ferroelastic material with a magnet. And then you have different mechanisms that I want to describe now. So first one, let's talk about strain effects. <clears throat> so basically in strain effects, you want to combine piezoelectricity with magnetostriction. So there's a lot of literature on the subject. So I just picked that, uh, that uh, example from Weiler. I think it's from Garching. <clears throat> So here, the authors have used a PZT actuator. So that's a really bulk uh, piece of PZT. And on top of that, they deposited nickel. And because nickel has a finite mass restriction, when you apply a voltage to the piezoelectric, it will deform. And uh, the nickel, which is attached to it, either directly deposited or glued with, a, with a, some composites or something, <coughs> some epoxy, the nickel will also deform, and uh, this will change. Is um, it will induce some magnetoelastic anisotropy in the nickel that will compete with the other anisotropy. And so, if the magnetoelastic anisotropy is strong enough, the easy axis of magnetization will switch by 90 degrees. So, I think I, I don't want to go through these details, but I want to show you the results. <coughs> so, you can see here when the magnet. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Please turn off your mic. Okay. So let me continue. Okay. I'll, uh, okay. Wait. <coughs> I turned off the mic. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So uh, here you can see the. Um, Magnetization curves measure when the field is applied along, along Y. So vertically here and here along X. And this is for two different magnetic electric fields applied. Here, when you see that when you have negative voltage, we are Y is an easy axis and X is a hard axis. And when we have a plus 30 volts, X is the easy axis and Y is the hard axis. Okay, so you can electrically control <laughs> Uh, easy axis. Mark, how much time do I have left? Okay, so now you have uh, about 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this and so continuing with this train effect, so this can also be uh, visualized using uh, magnet optical uh, care effect. So this is a uh, work from Sebastian Van Dyken, cobalt iron on top of barium titanate. So barium titanate uh, is a ferroelastic, and basically at uh, room temperature, you, the polarization can be oriented along uh, two in-plane directions or out of plane. And typically in the virgin state, it's gonna be mostly along uh, the in-plane. So you have this so-called A1 and A2 uh, coexisting domains. And this is an optical image using a polarized, uh, a polarized microscope. And through the birefringence of barium titanate, you can image the domains. And you see that when the cobalt iron is from the upwards. This does not affect very much the existing anisotropy from the, the previously deposited iron. But here, if you have uh, a change in the A domain configuration, you see that you induce a strong change in the anisotropy. And then the, the magnetic easy axis switches again. So briefly, uh, moving to this iron rhodium system, which is very unique. Uh, it, has, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it has a metamagnetic transition just above room temperature. So it's, it's anti-ferromagnetic at low temperature, and then it becomes ferromagnetic at about 380 Kelvin. And this is a first order phase transition. 
there's a large cell volume that is associated, a uh, change in the cell volume that is associated with this transition, which implies that there's a strong coupling between structure and magnetism. So we grew iron rhodium thin films epitaxially on barium titanate. And um, basically, we wanted to see how uh, the iron rhodium would behave when we apply an electric field to switch the domain structure of barium titanate from being mostly A domains to being mostly C domains. So I want to go quickly through this. So here you see that when we, this is X-ray x -ray diffraction as a function of electric field. When we apply an electric field, the sample, which is initially a mixture of C and A domains, becomes essentially only C domains. So we go from this to that. So then when we uh, uh, measure the magnetization of the sample, so basically we measure the iron rhodium, uh, this is what we get. So this is a zoom of the, of the data. You see the first order transition from the antiferromagnetic state with low magnetization to the ferromagnetic state. And then when we come back to the hysteresis because it's first order, this is a zero voltage. Now we do the same, but we apply a voltage across the material and the transition is shifted by about 20 Kelvin to higher temperatures. And then we go back to zero and we recover something that looks like the virgin curve. And if you apply now minus 21 volts, we again see the shift towards uh, large values. And then we can come back. So we have a clear, strong effect of the uh, electric field on the transition temperature. And if we sit at a given temperature, uh, we are going to see a strong variation. So this is at 385K. We measure the magnetization as a function of voltage. So we start here in the antiferromagnetic state. We are able to induce uh, a large moment. And then we see this hysteresis, okay? So uh, after the first branch, we have a mostly uh, symmetric effect, which tells us that the effect is mostly driven by strain. Uh, as I will show in the next few slides, we don't seem to have a very strong uh, effect from charge accumulation or depletion from the ferroelectric BTO because this should result in a strong asymmetric uh, response. So let me go quickly through that. This is another way to visualize this effect using XPIM at the iron LH at 380 k I think, 85 k You see that depending on the voltage that is applied, we are able to go from an antiferromagnetic state where we have almost no signal to a ferromagnetic state where we have this large red and blue contrast which correspond to ferromagnetic domains in the ferromagnetic state. So advantages and inconvenience of this strain approach. So it's bulk related, so it applies to the whole ferromagnetic field, film, which is not the case for other uh, approaches. Uh, there's a number of material you can choose from, piezoelectric, magnetostructive materials, and sometimes you can have very large effects. However, um, usually most of the work has been done with bulk. If you want to do go towards miniaturized devices, you want to work with uh, for piezoelectric film films, uh, which are, I mean, much less easy to work with. And first you have to grow them, it's not easy. And uh, typically you're gonna need uh, quite high voltages. And there's issue with the fatigue because a lot of strain involves a lot of, of stress on the mechanical properties and maybe fatigue uh, occurs uh, after a few cycles. Second mechanism, field effect. So here you want to accumulate or deplete charges from a gate insulator. You can use a ferroelectric gate insulator, ideally. And then this accumulation or depletion of charges is going to modify the uh, magnetic properties of a material adjacent to it in a channel, for instance, in this kind of geometry. So you, ideally, you want to use a material with carrier-mediated magnetism such as manganese dope carrier arsenide or manganite, which are double exchange for magnets. And you want it to be very thin because the accumulation or depletion of charges, as I've mentioned before, is only going to occur over the typically the Thomas Fermi screening length, which is at most a few nanometers. 
So there's a number of results in the literature using uh, manganites. So this is by no means exhaustive, but uh, this is work uh, by the 20 group in collaboration with Jean-Marc Fuscone, where uh, using some manganites and PZT, I believe, the TC was shifted by uh, maybe 20 Kelvin. And you can also see here that the magnetization depends on the ferroelectric state. In this other set of results from, uh, I think, Charles Zahn uh, in Yale, um, some kind of results were obtained and uh, direct observation of the modulation of the charge density in manganese was also obtained. So um, I don't think there are very, very spectacular results uh, using ferroelectrics and magnets to control magnetization with very strong amplitudes and, and at room temperature and, uh, <laughs> and remanent effect. However, I wanted to show you another uh, batch of results, um, mostly from Japan, uh, combining uh, applying electric field through a dielectric to very thin layers of transition metals. So here, this is iron. I think this is one of the very first papers from Yoshishige Suzuki. They had iron MGO and they apply a large voltage across the MGO to accumulate charges into the iron. And as you can see, by doing that, they were able to switch the magnetic easy axis uh, in the iron layer. This is from Teru Ono from Kyoto. And uh, he has done a number of very nice experiments um, controlling magnetism of very thin layers of cobalt, 0.4 nanometers, very, very thin. And uh, either using applying a voltage across uh, a dielectric, in this case, they had MgO and aluminum oxide, or using ionic liquid, which of course allows to accumulate and deplete a much larger amount of charge. You can see here that they were able to uh, control the shape of the magnetic stereosis loop, basically turning on and off magnetism at a given temperature. And in fact, what happened is that the TC is shifted by maybe 10 or 20 Kelvin when the voltage is applied. When the ionic liquid is used, the voltage uh, is, doesn't, doesn't need to be so high and the effect is much more spectacular. You can see that the shift can be up to more than 100 Kelvin. And so this is, uh, I think, very encouraging. But because in principle, with the best ferroelectrics, you are able to uh, accumulate or deplete charges with about the same amount as what you use with ionic liquids, in theory. Uh, and so this gives hope that you could do the same thing with ferroelectrics, but I think there's a lot of material science to do uh, to reach this goal. So advantages of this approach, I mean, it does not involve strain, so it should be less prone to fatigue. Uh, it's well suited to epithelial structure, so you probe. Uh, it's really interfacial effect. So if you are dealing with vertical transport in tunnel junctions, for instance, which also uh, probe uh, interfacial effects, then maybe it's uh, the best approach. The inconvenient is that, I mean, to be an interfacial effect is also an inconvenient because you need to work with very thin layers, and uh, so far uh, it seems to work better with. Uh, uh, well, it should be more applicable to carbon-mediated magnets, but so far the most uh, spectacular results are with the 3D alloys. And I think there's room for improvement uh, in, in, in this direction. And the last uh, part is using exchange coupling. So I will come back to the multiferroic. So this is an example of a device that one could make by controlling magnetism uh, with an electric field using exchange coupling. So this is uh, what we call uh, magnetoelectric uh, random access memory. So you have here a spin valve, which can be a tunnel junction. So you have your two ferromagnets separated by an insulating layer or maybe by a metallic spacer like copper. And this sits on top of a multiferroic, which is ferroelectric and antiferromagnetic. As you know, as I told you, there are very few ferromagnetic ferroelectrics. If we had ferromagnetic ferroelectric at room temperature, it would be much easier, but we don't. So this is basically going to work with uh, bismuth ferrite, for instance. Bismuth ferrite is probably the only room temperature multiferroic. So basically, the device works as follows. You have a coupling between the polarization and the, and the spins in the multiferroic. When you switch the polarization, 
the spins in the multifluoric are switching as well. And if there's a coupling between the magnetization of the bottom floor magnet and the spins in the antiflow magnet, this magnetization will also switch. And as a result, the resistance in the spin valve will change. And you will get this kind of resistance versus voltage curves. So this is not uh, easy to do. You need uh, a lot of uh, conditions to, to achieve that. You need to have a large exchange coupling between your multifluoric and your ferromagnets. Uh, you need to avoid leakage across the ferroelectric. You need to have GMR or TMR on your, uh, in your spin valve. And of course, you need to be able to control the exchange coupling by electric field through the magnetoelectric coupling in the multifluoric material. So this was done on, in BFO, and most of the effort has been from the Ramesh group at Berkeley. And so this is uh, an image of the device. So they have a cobalt iron uh, layer cut by platinum or a spin valve with two cobalt iron layers spaced by a thin layer of copper. And this sits on top of a bismuth ferrite film uh, grown on top of a transfer methanate bottom electrode and this prism scanned substrate. So the idea here is that the magnetization of the weak moment of the weak magnetic moment of bismuth ferrite which is perpendicular to the polarization is going to switch when an electric field is applied. Okay, so basically you want to go from here to there. Okay, so you switch the magnetization direction. This is not a very simple process. It occurs in two steps, and um, but it seems to work actually, uh, at least in this kind of samples. So this switching works, and you can see that here, so this is X-ray photoelectron, uh, photoemission electron microscopy, XPIM, at the cobalt edge, looking at the magnetic domain structure of the cobalt iron layer when a voltage is applied to the bismuth ferrite. So you can see that initially the magnetic domains are black, pointing in a given direction. And when you switch the voltage, you apply voltage, you are able to switch the magnetization and you are able to recover something that looks like the initial state after uh, a positive point. Okay, so this is a quite good indication that it works. And um, this is the GMR curve of the cobalt iron, copper cobalt iron uh, trilayer. And this is the resistance of the trilayer as a function of the voltage. And you see that they are able to achieve an almost complete switching of the resistance with voltage that mimics the sketch that I had here in this uh, device that uh, was proposed more than 10 years ago. So this work, this was published uh, six years ago in Nature and um, there's a lot of room for improvement still, in particular as uh, regarding um, endurance, because if you want to make a device out of this, you need to have endurance up to millions and maybe billions of cycles. Um, but this is probably the most compelling uh, result on magnetoelectric switching uh, at room temperature. Um, in principle, you could you have to work with bismuth ferrite. That's an inconvenient because there's very few room temperature for multiferroics, but you could work with other ferromagnetic alloys aside from cobalt iron. And uh, it's a quite complicated mechanism because you have all these different couplings that act together, coupling between uh, the electric field and the polarization, between the polarization and the spins in the multifluoric, and between the spins and the magnetization in the ferromagnet. And all these must act together and many, many times if you want to uh, make it a device. Yeah. So this is very challenging, but probably the most promising direction yet. Okay, so I'm reaching my conclusion. So, um, so this was about oxide spintronics. So I've hopefully, hopefully I've shown you that oxide materials can bring new possibilities in spintronics. With half metals such as manganites, you can reach very high TMR. This very high spin polarization also can be used to gain insight into the spin dependent density of state of a contour electrode. I've shown you results with LSMO, but you can also do it with a uh, cobalt, for instance. Um, you can introduce ferromagnetic insulator and most of which are oxides in the barrier and you get 
spin filtering, and in principle, you should get very high TMR. It's not exactly conclusive yet, but uh, finite TMR has been observed. For electrics, as tunnel barriers can produce very strong tunnel electro-resistant effects, I think the largest values of tuna are maybe 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 of all ratio, and uh, they can be used as um, electronic synapses for neuromorphic computing. When you combine these two effects using multifluorex as tunnel barriers, you can have multiple state devices. But uh, this is still a challenge to have this at room temperature. I've shown you three approaches to control magnetism uh, with electric field, strain, uh, field effect, and exchange coupling. And I think there's a number of interesting results in, in each, but to me, the most promising is the last one using this ferrite from the work of Ramesh. And uh, there's a, a very promising approach and related to the interest of Intel that I will uh, emphasize in the next talk. Uh, that uh, leads us to believe leads us to believe that maybe these uh, BFO devices will become a practical device in the future. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Manuel. Um, so uh, just a uh, a few comments. First uh, comment was um, there were some. Um, some interferences, I would say. Uh, so the sound was garbled uh, on a couple of uh, occasions. Uh, fortunately, we have a recording, a pre-recording that was made by Manuel. So um, at least you can have a uh, non-garbled version of this thing. Um, the second comment I would like to make is at some point um, someone um, um, did not turn off their mic and uh, we had background noise. So I will kindly ask, ask you all to turn off your mics during the presentation. Uh, that's disruptive for the, for the group and for the speaker. Um, the uh, third comment is the format when there is a two lecture um, a case, so for Manuel, that's the case. We just heard the lecture one, and on Wednesday, there will be lecture two. Um, I said that for the uh, first presentation, uh, people who had question to ask should use the uh, chat uh, feature uh, to ask the questions that I would select uh, if there were many, but I noticed that there is none. So there was zero question. So either Manuel was super clear and everybody knew what he had to uh, say, or since there's none, if someone has a, uh, a pressing question to ask after lecture one, you can unmute your uh, mic and ask your question. Okay, so, um, so sorry, hey Mark, it, it's yeah. Ricardo here. No, okay. I had to unmute my mic. No, I had one question to Manuel because he mentioned the, the spintronics on bismuth ferrite. And yeah. uh, uh, how, how much trouble it is because all these multiferroics, they are unfortunately anti-ferromagnetic, right? Yeah. Uh, how much trouble it is that it's not a ferromagnetic ordering to, to get oh. the proper uh, it's transport. <laughs> it's a lot of trouble because uh, if the if they were ferromagnetic, the coupling with uh, I mean in the device I was showing, yeah, this device. Um, if if you had a ferromagnet, if the ferroelectric the ferroelectric was also ferromagnetic, then the coupling with the bottom blue layer here would be much stronger. Here the coupling is quite weak because it, it's related to the weak moment of BFO. So BFO is not exactly a, a pure antiferromagnet. It has also a weak canted moment. And the coupling, and as I understand it from the results of Ramesh, um, is related. Uh, basically, the coupling is between the magnetization of this bottom blue layer and the weak moment of uh, the bispit ferrite. So the larger that, that moment, the stronger the coupling. 
So if it was a proper ferromagnet, it would be much easier. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there is in the chat feature, there is a question from uh, Jorik uh, Birkhulzer, but I will let him ask the question since again, there were not too many. Uh, good morning. My question concerns the uh, ferroelectric tunnel junction that you show uh, with the uh, barium titanite. Yeah. You showed that you achieve a partial switching, but I was wondering how do you do the uh, PFM measurement, although there is this top electrode? Yeah. So uh, if the electrode is not too thick, you, you are still able to probe the, um, the deformation of the ferroelectric below the electrode through its piezoelectric effect. So the, the electric field is applied globally across the whole junction area, but still you, are, you still have a special resolution because you are, you are probing the, um, the deformation, uh, basically the piezo response uh, at the local space because it. So if the, if the top electrode is only a few, maybe 10, 10 nanometer thick, or maybe 20 nanometer thick maximum, you are able to uh, measure contrast below it. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Other questions from, um, from anyone? You can, um, you can activate your mic and, uh, and ask your question if you have one. Okay, let's wait uh, just a minute or so. Oh, hi, I am Ruby, and I am curious to know about this field, uh, electric uh, tunnel junction. So you showed the junction between iron, barium titanate, and LSMO. Yeah. So I'm curious to know about that if we use paramagnetic instead of ferromagnetic material, what results are expected? Okay, so if you use, for instance, gold instead of iron, then um, in terms of spin-dependent tunneling, I guess you will not see any TMR, but you may see, for instance, TAMR, that's another effect called tunneling anisotropic matter resistance. Mm -hmm. But uh, as regards the tunnel electroresistance, I think it will be the same. I mean, it, it does, the tunnel electroresistance Mm -hmm. Does not need the materials to be um, to be ferromagnetic. Okay. So we have some results on BFO junctions where we have uh, manganite as our tunnel and as our bottom electrode, which has a low TC, so at room temperature is not magnetic. And we try different uh, top electrode materials like uh, tungsten, I think, and maybe iridium, so mm -hmm. that are not magnetic and we see um, also tunnel electroresistance. Then what determines the amplitude of the tunnel electroresistance is a number of, of parameters of the metal. For instance, it's a um, work function. If you have a, a larger work function, typically you get, we get larger tunnel electroresistance, but uh, the devices can be sometimes harder to switch. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, additional questions? Okay, I see uh, the okay. Yeah. question. Uh, the one nanometer BTU, do you think it can be affected by the screening effect at the electrode interface? So you mean the BTU itself? Um, I think it's possible, yes. I think it's a good question. At these very low uh, thicknesses, the barium titanate... Uh, so I remember this paper by Max Stengel and studying I think somebody uh, has his microphone on and is typing the keyboard. Huh? So yeah, so there's this paper by Nicolas Pobbing and, and Max Singer, who um, shows really that the details of the screening process at the interface uh, 
um, involve also the nature of the parallelic and the precise stacking sequence. So I guess if the if you um, when the parallelic is very thin, I think this effect will be prominent. So I think uh, the answer is uh, yes. Okay. Um, so I will, uh, if there is one more question, I will let it, um, ah, second question, I see. Okay. Go ahead. Do you see the question, Manuel? Uh, she is writing the question. Do, Do you think it help if I build a super lattice with BTO device? Um, so, if you mean using a super lattice, I don't know, BTO, STO super lattice, as the tunnel barrier, I think it can be interesting, but you need to make sure that the total thickness of the super lattice is still compatible with tunneling. So typically uh, less than maybe four nanometers or five nanometers max. And uh, then if you want to say, if you make a super lattice of uh, bottom elec uh, electrode, ferroelectric, electrode, super ferroelectric, you have like a different tunnel junction in series. Uh, I think it may be difficult to disentangle the switching properties of each uh, junction in the series. But um, using a ferroelectric super lattice as the tunnel barrier yet would be interesting. I don't think people have done that really. Maybe by layers, I think I see a BTO for instance, but not super lattice. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. So I think we'll, uh, we'll leave at that. Okay. Uh, so once again, thank you, Emmanuel. I mean, you know, you uh, kick-started the event and all the little glitches, you had to uh, yeah. live through them, but that's, uh, you know, that's part of the fun. So um, we will um, reconvene in uh, a little over four hours. So it will be uh, 4.30 uh, Paris time. And um, thank you for being here, and, and please uh, come back. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.